Hi, this is Cynthia Horner from Right on Digital, and I am here with Chris Matthews, and he is going to talk to us today about his profession. He is a wonderful family therapist and a relationship counselor, and he also authors books. So, Chris, the first question that I'd like to ask you is, has the profession that you're in picked up due to the fact that we've been in a pandemic for a couple of years and people may need services because of the fact that everybody's lives changed? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, the service amount hasn't picked up, but the intensity has. And what I mean by that, prior to the pandemic, couples and families were seeking out mental health services, but the intensity and the urgency and the needs of those services have altered since the pandemic. There are a lot of couples who I treat prior to the pandemic, they may have sought out therapy to get a grip or gauge the relationship and to improve it. Now they're seeking out therapy to determine if they even want to have the relationship altogether. So I believe the pandemic was more of a pressure cooker. It actually enhanced the intensity that clients are bringing into therapy, more so all or nothing. Are we going to stay together or are we going to break up? Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of families, um, I'm in the New York area. So, of course, there are a lot of apartment buildings. With yeah. the pandemic, a lot of people were confined to a very um, small space, whereas pre-pandemic, children would go to school and they were they were gone out of the house for maybe eight to 10 hours and parents were working, most of them. So they were out of the house. So mainly people interacted with each other maybe after five or six o'clock. And, you know, but with the pandemic, people were all together and you couldn't really move around. You couldn't go to activities. You couldn't even go outside for a while because there were some restrictions. As a result, a lot of people were getting very frustrated with um, each other. Um, there, were, I know there were a lot of instances of domestic um, abuse and violence that were on the rise because people really couldn't escape each other. So can you talk a little bit about um, that? Because now part of the pandemic has lifted, but it comes and goes in waves. You know, sometimes they tell you, you, you don't have to wear a mask, then they're back to wearing masks, um, being vaccinated to go to events. Um, events are still getting canceled sometimes. Um, so everybody's still kind of in quandary about what to do, how to act around each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you, you, you make a great point. The pandemic forced people to be confined to smaller spaces and it limited the amount of time we could spend out in the community with other people. So what, what I find as a therapist is that although the domestic violence rates have increased, it's, it's been a lot of different factors. We also have to look at the substance and alcohol use rates. Those have increased as well. So when you have this concoction of a pandemic, increase in substance use, there's also been for a lot of people, a change of career. A lot of people have left the workforce. So that gives even additional idle time. When you put all that together, there is a combustion that occurred and it's gonna take years, if not decades to recover from that. Emotionally, people did not have certain outlets for a lot of individuals, those social connections were lost or limited. And we can't really get that same level of satisfaction by way of a Zoom call or a computer or FaceTime. It's, it's nothing that can really replace that human interaction. Now, as we subside and the pandemic somewhat is, is going down a little bit, you're seeing people regroup, but there's still that hesitancy because 
like you said earlier, there can be a call to action for people to uh, go back indoors any given moment. So we're living in this state of, is it over? Is it not really over? And you, you find that that does play a role in people's ability to be sociable. So I think that as more time goes on, we, we, we gain more knowledge around the issues associated with the pandemic, we'll be better suited to treat them. Mm -hmm. Now, your particular practice, do you deal more with couples or do you deal more with families at this stage? So due to the complexity of family therapy, I have a lot more couples that I see. And I usually will see families by way of the subsystem. So when I say subsystem, the, the, the husband, wife, or the, the dating partners, they'll usually integrate children in after a few sessions to make it a family session. Or what's really common, I'll find that that couple will request that the parents come in because there might be issues with in-laws or hmm. issues with managing boundaries with parents. So that's been a huge component of family counseling. And last but not least, when there are teenagers or young adults making that transformation from being a child to a teenager or a teenager to a young adult, there are a lot of uh, cases where one, one child may be coming out around their sexuality and they might be presenting to the family as being gay or, or lesbian and they need the family counseling to help mitigate that conversation. And the parents may need to have questions answered and just to create a safe environment to have that dialogue and rebuild connection. So those are some of the most common themes around the family counseling. But more importantly, I look at all the work that I do, whether it be an individual, a couple or a family, that I take a systemic approach and I see that person beyond just their presenting issues or problems. Mm -hmm. Now, would you say that there are more African-Americans attempting to get counseling these days? Because I remember um, back in the day, you didn't talk about certain issues. You didn't discuss um, mental health. You didn't discuss um, family breakdowns, anything like that, because it was like you weren't supposed to tell your business. Mm -hmm. So what you're describing is, 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 is very common in the African-American community. We call them uh, closed systems. So in, in African-American community, historically, we were taught that we keep our business, our business, and outside of speaking to a minister or a pastor or a religious leader, you didn't share. And you even were very cautious in those environments. I believe that counseling is opening up to uh, African-Americans and persons of color because of the, the push that you see through uh, the mainstream media. There are a lot of celebrities that talk about counseling now. I believe the Obamas, they, they talked about, Michelle Obama talked about in her book, Becoming, how she and Barack encountered counseling and, and Jay-Z and Beyonce. So when you see these celebrity figures and Will Smith, he's talked about counseling. So a lot of the people that are representing the African-American community in a, in a place of fame and prestige, they, they're mentioning counseling. And I believe it's kind of reducing that stigma. And for so long, black people just have not trusted any type of formalized medical service in general. Uh, we were the test dummies. So when you can find therapists that look like me or those that favor your culture and can be authentic, that in itself has been opening up the door for more mental health services as well. That's very interesting what you said about everything you're saying is very interesting, but especially about the fact that we've had a lot of high profile people who have had some problems and they have decided that they should share part of their story with their fans and and other people. And I do think that that has helped because when you think of celebrities and influencers, you're thinking that these people have it all. They have money, they have fame, they can do whatever they want. But at the end of the day, we're all human. Mm -hmm. We all bleed. We all die. We all go through the same things. So getting that conversation out is kind of helpful because I remember 
a long time ago when President Gerald Ford was in office and he was married to Betty Ford and she let it out that she had a problem with alcohol mm-hmm. and you know things of that nature and before that of course no one really talked about that either too much and they ended up um, opening up Betty Ford clinics um, a lot of other women that were married to high profile men started sharing their stories about how difficult it was to cope with certain things so therefore you would turn to alcohol or drugs or whatever it was that you could use to self-medicate. But, um, you know, I think that also when you talk about the high profile celebrities sharing their story, the fact that social media is so prevalent that they're using social media as their way to get the story out. Mm-hmm. And the story gets out very timely and the celebrities get to control the narrative about what is said because they're the ones that are actually putting that story out instead of a journalist. Right. So they get to say what they want. And I think that that has helped too because it clears up different misconceptions that way. It does. And social media has been a really unique tool now to, like you said, provide a voice that comes directly from the person. And it doesn't have to be filtered through a journalist or a third party. I believe that we have to be mindful that social media, once again, can be a tool to help or a tool that can be hurtful. And when I find that clients are utilizing social media as a replacement for therapy, that can be hurtful. And that looks like sharing your marital business or your family business out to the world. And I just had an Instagram post recently that, that kind of caught wind. I described how in that post, it's very brief, your marriage business needs to remain your marriage business. And that's why it's called an intimate relationship. So being mindful that expressing yourself is therapeutic, but it's not therapy there are certain conversations that still need to stay private. And that's when social media can create harm. And when you find someone reaching or seeking out for help and it is told to the whole world, that may go into the wrong hands. So I'm very cautious about telling people, yes, it's awesome to be open, but make sure that you respect the fact that when you share something out to the world, your story has meaning and value and everyone isn't privy to that value. So be very selective on what you wanna share because it could, it could harm you. And that's something that I always try to present to clients. Mm-hmm. I'm glad that you mentioned that because you are correct that a lot of people use social media instead of seeking out professional And sometimes um, what they do ends up taking the wrong turn. Um, For instance, I know that there have been different celebrities who posted on social media that they can't cope anymore. And they've even stated that they plan to do something drastic. They did not talk to a therapist, but they went on, put these posts out, and then they've taken their lives. And then after that, people have seen these posts and said, wow, that person was crying out for help, but they mm-hmm. didn't actually get the help. All they did was post stuff on social media and now they're not here anymore. And mm-hmm. it's a very, very unfortunate situation. Yeah. So can you tell me what would you, what advice would you give to young people who are particularly vulnerable about um, suicide um, and have the tendencies to maybe want to um, take their own life and not um, reach out to um, professionals who might be able to kind of get them back on track. Mm -hmm. Because some people, they wouldn't even know what to do. They may have heard the term therapy but they don't really know how do you even research getting 
a therapist and what happens with a therapist? Yeah, so so let's let's slow down and in, in, in first process death by suicide usually occurs when the client or the person has experienced so much pain they only believe the solution to that pain or the resolve would be to not be here anymore. So, so that's what makes it a disorder or a mental health crisis. The, the person is just attempting to escape the pain. The second piece to that, and what I would tell young people, and this is what you should, you should go, you know, tell someone if they're thinking about taking their life. A lot of times people are seeking relief through acceptance. So, instead of trying to defend, the, defend that person's position or, or rebuttal. If someone says life is hard and you look at them and go, what are you complaining about? At that point, it makes that individual who's contemplating taking their life think that they're not strong enough to handle the struggles of life. So, so life is, is, is suffering. 